Now the next presentation is going to be given by Leonardo Guidoni, and the title is Ab initio Molecular Dynamics in Natural and Artificial Photosynthesis. to thank the organizer for such nice uh, place where to organize uh, a one day workshop and um, so I will talk about mainly about uh, um, uh, QMMN calculations are you able to see the yes uh, QMMN calculation on uh, the natural uh, uh, part of, uh, of uh, photosynthesis I mean everything is coming up uh, from the energy problem so basically uh, to make a long story short, as you know, if you are looking for carbon neutral, that means that uh, are not uh, introducing new carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, fuels, energy sources, you don't have many chances. And one of the major chances that you have is actually solar uh, energy. And one key point is not just transform solar energy into... into um, uh, for instance, uh, electric energy, but also in sto to store solar energy in a fuel. Because we need fuel for transportation and we need fuel actually for accumulated energy. And that's actually what the plants have done uh, since a lot of time uh, during photosynthesis. So they just uh, create organic molecules like glucose or ATP to store the energy. And we are still using this such such uh, photosynthetic energy when you burn, for instance, uh, the fuel of your car. So it's a sort of old photosynthesis energy. So uh, this picture I like, uh, it comes uh, out uh, from a Chemical Society Review cover in 2009, because it tells you what is uh, uh, the paradigm in some way of artificial photosynthesis. So on the left, you have uh, uh, a tree, and on the right, you have a sort of unspecified uh, um, device that is able to transform light energy into electricity, into fuel, and into chemical uh, compounds. So let's have a more look, a closer look to um, what's happening in the, in the natural system. So actually, uh, we uh, we are lucky. I mean, otherwise I would not be here because two years ago it was crystallized the main actor of this uh, uh, transformation. Because the, the most difficult step is uh, uh, the water splitting process. So passing from uh, two water molecules to hydrogen and electrons. And this actually process generates uh, uh, generate, uh, uh, dioxygen as, as a side uh, uh, effect in some way, as side product. And this is actually the ox oxygen we are breathing now. We are breathing oxygen generated since two and a half billion of years of photosynthesis that occurred on the Earth. And in this, uh, this enzyme, which is photosystem 2, is quite special. It's quite special because it remains almost unchanged for two and a half billion of years. And it's also quite special because it's the unique enzyme which is able to do water splitting. So it's nice that now we have a nice crystal structure and we can also study by computer simulation. Actually, the, the, the core of this enzyme is a manganese for calcium uh, oxo compounds, so something very nasty from the computational point of view, but we have tried to, uh, to study it uh, um, anyway. So the, the final goal would be uh, sort of uh, having uh, a, an artificial leaf, like uh, uh, Daniel Nocera uh, was uh, uh, naming this kind of device. That means a device that is able, like for instance, uh, here you have a silicon junction. On the left, uh, you have uh, a half of the, of the reaction that do water splitting. On the right, you have the generation of hydrogen. And then you can use hydrogen as fuel on the right. And then, uh, uh, but you need also the other half of the reaction, of course, to do the water splitting. And the most difficult thing from the technological point of view is actually uh, to choose a catalyst for water splitting, which, uh, is, uh, which has to be uh, economic, if you want to use this really on large uh, scale, and to provide distributed uh, energy genera uh, generators uh, overall uh, in every place where there is some, uh, some sun. 
Okay, so this is the this is the, the system. It's a very huge protein. It's actually 20 comp 20 proteins uh, kept together. And uh, here you have a scheme. What is happening is that uh, um, the most difficult step in photosynthesis is actually the first initial charge separation. You have elect. Um, you have to imagine that around this molecule there are all the other molecules that just collect the energy. They are called antenna system. Collect the energy from the sun. Uh, and uh, by uh, energy transfer, chlorophyll to chlorophyll jumping, they come to these uh, 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 two chlorophyll that are a special pair of chlorophyll. And this special pair of chlor chlorophyll uh, donates electron on the, on the upper side and uh, they oxidize this tyrosine and the, the tyrosine oxidizes the manganese cluster. And the manganese cluster, after four, uh, having accumulated four oxidizing equivalents, so four electron less uh, can perform finally the water splitting. So there are a lot of interesting things coming out of uh, this structure. For instance, you can identify where the protons are uh, get, getting out of the cluster, where the water is coming in, and, uh, and so on. Uh, basically, the full catalytic cycle is uh, described uh, through this uh, Koch cycle, um, and is um, you have protons and electrons that alternate, that go out of this cluster. Of course, there is also the protein around uh, in, a, in a catalytic cycle. And there are uh, several states that are called S state, S0, S1, S2, and so on. A lot of spectroscopy is known about this state, but almost, I mean, very few information is known from the point of view of reaction mechanism. Um, okay, so now we will focus on one of the, of the uh, I mean, just one piece of this, uh, of this cycle, which uh, is the S2 state. And um, one thing that come up uh, that is a bit weird uh, on the crystal structure is that this oxygen here has a rather strange distance with respect to the manganese. All the other oxygen are at 2.1 angstrom, but this one is 2.5 and 2.6, so it's, it's, it's strange. Okay, and that's uh, what uh, uh, last year uh, uh, it was proposed that actually in the crystal structure there are two different um, conformations. This one where the oxygen is on the right and this one where the oxygen is on the left. Okay, and in the crystal you see both and you see the oxygen in the middle. And one conformation uh, I mean, this structure has a very complicated uh, um, ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic coupling uh, that we, we, we are treating by broken symmetries. And uh, um, actually, uh, this model here, which is model B, it has a high spin ground state. And this model here is has a low spin ground state. And then EPR spectroscopy can recognize this uh, difference in spin. So you have two signals that correspond to these two kinds of uh, uh, conformation. Uh, so then, then we are coming, and uh, what what would we want to we would like to do is to see which is the interconversion between these two structures, and actually are the two structures have any role in the catalytic cycle, and who is coming first? There are also a lot of experiments that comes from the 19, but even before uh, I don't I cannot enter in detail. I can just you uh, give a feeling of that. Uh, they basically study the system at different temperature with different condition of irradiation condition, so different kind of light incident, and, uh, and they did uh, many exp APR experiments. And actually, they turn out that uh, um, the, the signal that they had the, at the end for this state is very dependent on the temperature, on the protocol procedure, and also. Um, on, uh, on the kind of irradiation that you have. Like at uh, uh, low temperature, you get, for instance, a high spin signal, and at high temperature, you get a low spin signal, and you don't know why. So we, we came with QMMM molecular dynamics uh, with broken symmetry and DFT plus U. You need uh, something more than plain GGA. Um, and actually, uh, we, we have the, the dynamics of the full system at the classical level, but then you have to select, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, a, a region that will be treated at the quantum level. 
And then you can run uh, Bonoppenheimer molecular dynamics on this uh, subset in a QMMM scheme. Uh, that means that you, uh, you fill uh, in, a, in, a, in a Hamiltonian way uh, the external field uh, of, the full, of the full protein. And um, it's, um, this we did with the CP2K code, which is uh, very nice for, and very quick. Um, and what, what is important, I would just to stress, is that the mo doing molecular dynamics on system, such complex system is really crucial because it allows you to uh, overcome very small energy barrier that otherwise you would never overcome if you just do geometry optimization. Of course, if you want to see, if you want really to escape from free energy minima, then you need some metadynamics. But anyway, you are able to uh, to overcome a small barrier and the hydrogen bond network is arranging and, and so on. Okay, so uh, let's see, this is the picture that we have. So we did uh, um, molecular dynamics, we can also calculate the free energy by thermodynamical integration of the intercombustion between model A and model B. As reaction coordinate, we have uh, a combination of distance that describe the transition from A to B, which is this. And uh, what comes out is that uh, the transition from A to B occurs in, in the low spin state. Okay? And the energy difference actually here is very small. So the A state, the, low, the ground state of the A state is, uh, uh, is low spin, but the energy difference is very small, so we are supposed also to populate other spin states, even in the ground state of A. And the same is the other way around. So basically, I mean, uh, the, what is emerging from the, from the dynamics is the following picture. <coughs> you have model A, which is slightly thermodynamically more stable than model B. And you have a barrier between them about 10 kcal. Uh, and the interconversion between A and B occurs in low spin. So if you are in A, and then you can cross. Uh, 10 kcal corresponds to about, uh, uh, I mean, if you are at a temperature which is higher to 150 degrees, then you can overcome 10 kcal in a reasonable time from the experimental point of view. Good. If you are, if you are at, at the energy which is uh, lower, actually this crossing uh, cannot occur. So you are trapped either on the right or on the left side. And this can actually explain the, the experiments because, for instance, in this case, uh, you have that uh, uh, they are at 200, 220 uh, K. Uh, and they can see both signals because both states are populated when you uh, irradiate the sample. You can pass uh, thanks to the radiation from one side to the other. So both signals are populated. But then when you do the EPR uh, at 10 Kelvin, you cool down the system. And so only the thermodynamically more stable state will be populated. And you can only see the signal for this state. But when you decrease the temperature, what's happening is that uh, uh, when you switch off the light, then this state, even if it's not thermodynamically favorable, will never cross the barrier because the temperature is too low and you, only, and you see both signals, actually. And this is actually what experimentalists have seen. So these are a lot of experiments that from 90s and from 80s that can be rationalized by this kind of picture. Uh, but we would like to have some more insight of, uh, of, this, of the meaning of these two structures. So we can see which are the differences. And one of the differences between the two structures is that the, the second structure, this SB, has a more open structure. And we actually can see that uh, uh, there is a very small energy barrier for an additional water molecules to bind this manganese in SB. So this is very important because uh, uh, as this water moves and binds this manganese, then all the other water follow in a single line. And this can be actually an identification of the channel where the catalytic water enter into the reaction uh, site. So this can be the, the substrate water. Of course, there are a lot of debate on that, but this is our interpretation. You can go one step further 
and you can try to remove electrons from your system to see uh, if we are able also to, to see one more step in the Cox cycle. And if you do that, you, you realize this is the spin density on the tyrosine. You realize that the tyrosine gets oxidized, as you think, and the tyrosine is supposed to grab an electron from the cluster. But <coughs> just to, to make things uh, uh, short, uh, the tyrosine is able to oxidize the cluster only in model B, but not in model A. So that seems that it's another confirmation that A comes before B. Okay, so this is a sort of revised uh, and uh, picture of the uh, Cox cycle, I mean, pictorial picture, we did this for, for a cover. And uh, so basically what you have is that uh, A can be before B and then uh, in between uh, S2 and S3 there are this water line which is uh, uh, moving. I have no time to talk about uh, the other side of the, uh, um, of, of the history, of the story, uh, which is actually uh, the, um, uh, the inorganic cluster, which is, uh, in this case, we did uh, the full reaction part of uh, 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 water splitting. Here you have an oxygen molecule which is coming up uh, sooner or later, maybe after 15 minutes. Um, and uh, I think it's very interesting to, to study in parallel this and the natural system because we would like to know, I mean, you can learn from one how the other also is working, even if there are, of course, differences between them. The difference can help in, uh, I mean, rationalize, and the, the common feature can help in, both, in understanding both. So this is uh, the group, and here in red there are people that are involved in uh, photosynthesis research. Uh, and uh, then uh, thanks to uh, the funding and computational resources. Sorry for one minute late. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. <laughs> so we have time for maybe one question. My question is about the role of the environment, the protein on the, on the barrier of the... Yeah. Uh, we, uh, I mean, we have, we have quite a large quantum, quantum system. So it's about 200 atoms, okay? So my feeling is that uh, in this case it's not so crucial. And actually, what we have observed is that the energy differences that we have estimated by the free energy at room temperature is very similar to the energy difference that you can estimate by just cluster single point. But of course, you, have to, you need to have the, the correct starting structure. So it's, uh, it's, very, it's very good that you sample uh, by molecular dynamics uh, before uh, getting just uh, a representative structure of, uh, of the models. Is DFT plus U good enough for this kind of ferromagnetic, anti-ferromagnetic? I mean, we think, we think, we think yes. Okay, I mean, it's, it's, it's rather good. Uh, and we, what we did is that we compared uh, with um, uh, J coupling constants for small uh, manganese clusters where you have experiments and we got uh, very, I mean, very good agreement. Uh, and basically it's performing, I mean, in a similar way with respect to vitrilip. Uh, 